Okay, hi. Um, so, <laughs> look at that. Look at the nice graphics I spent some time on. Um, this, for this panel, um, the theme was all writing is autobiographical, what writing graphic biographies uh, reveal about the author. Um, you know, we have Amy, we have Barbara, we have Carla here. Um, each of them wrote uh, biographies of other artists, other creative, other creative people. Um, and so, you know, when I was reading all of them, I wanted to kind of, as, as you usually do with, um, with panels like this, go like, Okay, what is the thing this all has in common? Where, where do we draw the connection points? How do we take like three disparate kind of books, three completely different people, about three books about completely different people, right, and go, where does this all intersect? And, right, and also make it for you, the audience, because while well, I have read these books uh, several times now, I also assume maybe you haven't, right? that's fine. This will be a bit more generalized, but one of the big things I took away from this, and you'll see it in the line of questioning, is, oh, when you start to write, when you start to do biography as a cartoonist, rather than just a writer, you take over a little bit you, the artist, start to step in more than you might think you do, right? I don't know the, how much that is, and I'm excited to find out, having thought about these books for a while now, but that is, gonna, that is kind of one of the things that's going to be behind this line of questioning. So, kind of my first question. All right, I noticed in all three of these books, you all were kind of interested in other creatives, right? Carla, you're doing the biography of famous singer Donna Concha, mm -hmm. right? And if I butcher that, I apologize. Um, Barbara, you're dealing with, and I'm going to really get this one wrong, uh, Hipparachia, the Grecian philosopher, right? And Amy's book, while not any specific person, is kind of an amalgam of photojournalist in the American Dust Bowl, right? Talking about that time through a sort of, you know, a, a sort of fictional protagonist, but heavily researched into that era of America. And so, you know, my question is, like, when you're choosing your subject, when you're choosing what you're going to focus on, is it, was it you went, oh, that person, that's like me, I'm an artist, I'm a creative person, this, this instantly clicks with me, or was it, I want to say something about a certain time or a certain person, right? There's some, there's some yes, it's, it's almost incidental that they, too, are a creative person. Like, what was, the, what was the guiding force in your choice? <laughs> okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, that's a really good question because for, for Days of Sand, my book, it was definitely a kind of recognition. Um, I, by accident, I, I ended up in an exhibition in Paris in a museum called the Centre Pompidou. I think some people might know it. And it was an exhibition of a photographer called Walker Evans, yep. an American photographer who worked in the 1930s and 40s. And he was well, he's one of the best, I think. I mean, his photos are beautiful, all black and white, and he made photos of farmers and farmers' families um, in poverty, in, you know, in need of help. Um, and, you know, those photos really, uh, really touched me in so many ways. And one of the ways it touched me was that I also had done uh, journalism as an artist. I was drawing uh, for a newspaper in refugee camps in, in Europe, in Greece, and drawing in a place where people are living in terrible conditions, so without food, without water, without any basic needs, that's, that really, that's really difficult, especially if you are, I mean, you're, you're basically taking something from those people and you're going home and you give it to a newspaper and then you get paid while those people are still there in that poverty. So that, 
that was always the hardest part of my job. And when I was at that exhibition of Walker Evans, I really recognized that, that you know, the ethical questions of reportage and journalism, and uh, he himself had the same questions. And so that was, for me, the starting point of this graphic novel is that I thought, I wanna make a story about a photographer like Walker Evans in that time and how he uh, struggles with that, the way I struggled with it too. Uh, yes, for me, well, my story is about Hipparchia, the, one of the first women to become a philosopher in ancient Greece. And I've loved philosophy for, uh, well, about 25 years, many years, but I had never heard of uh, Hipparchia. And um, I bought a book about uh, female philosophers, and there I uh, read about her. It was about one, one or two pages was written about her, and this immediately touched me, because she was, uh, she came from a rich family, but she uh, decided to renounce all material possessions and live on the street like a vagrant. And I admire this rigorous choice of hers, and the, and the philosophical movement that she was part of. Uh, this is a, a philosophical movement that they, they propagated um, a minimalist lifestyle and they uh, turned against all social ranks and values. And I saw in that um, a story that is still uh, relevant today. So that was uh, what, what touched me and that I, I had a, a sort of feeling of urgency with this story. Maybe that's uh, silly to say about your own book, but uh, yeah, I felt it that way, that we need Hipparchia <laughs> <laughs> in, in this time. Uh, well, uh, I don't speak very well English, so sorry if I don't speak well, okay? <laughs> Uh, well, in my case, um, my interest about uh, Doña Concha, uh, that is a very famous singer in Spain, um, it was a total accident because uh, in my family, uh, my father is not a very, he don't likes too much music. My mother uh, um, listen all the time music in my house, but she is from Chile, so the culture that she has uh, is not is music, musically is not uh, is not Spanish is South American or North American, so I never listen Spanish music in my house never. Uh, in the moment that my grandmother goes to a I don't know how to say residency. Um, Yes, eso. Thank you. <laughs> That's my friend. <laughs> um, uh, she doesn't have memory. She, she is with, with al Alzheimer. And my father starts to put uh, music in, 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 well, in, well, start puts music in, in her. I don't know how to say. And uh, I usually uh, listen music with her and I start to listen the music of, of her um, um, epoca. Um, her time. Uh, her times, yes. Um, and then I start to listen tango, uh, boleros, uh, all perfect. And then I start to uh, um, listen copla. And it was a total love. Immediately, oh my God, what is this? Because the letters, you don't understand the letters, <laughs> but the, I will explain you the letters. The letters are amazing, that's it. Uh, it's all about uh, the main character always are women, very strong women, violent women, um, with vengeance, prostitutes, uh, very uh, women of the margins. And uh, I, I feel not, not very, uh, because I am not a prostitute, ni, <laughs> <laughs> ni vengeance woman, I am a normal woman, but I feel very uh, comfortable and I love the letters. So I, I say, I need to listen more of this music. And this kind of music in Spain is associated with the dictatorship, with the far right. I, I don't know why, because the letters it's not even the mm, typical woman of the 
right uh, party is not a very uh, woman, very soft, and all these kind of things. Is uh, the other side, the, the opposite, no? Uh, and I, I start to to listen, and the all of the singers I like uh, Concha Piquer. <laughs> it's, it's so weird to, to to talk about Concha Piquer here, but uh, Concha Piquer is a folkloric. It's a is the, the typical stereotype of uh, woman, uh, Spanish woman with the flowering his hair and uh, with the flamenco uh, dresses and all this kind of stuff. And I start to uh, to to um, read about her, and I feel completely completely um, in love because uh, she was also a very strong woman. Uh, she always do what he want, she wants to do, uh, a pesar de... <laughs> ah, lyrics, eso. Excuse me, L lyrics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> Well, um, eso. Uh, so, uh, no sé qué estaba diciendo. A pesar de que, es, uy, iba a decir hablar en español. Uh, <laughs> um, she always do whatever she wants, uh, and she was very strong. And borde, ¿cómo se diría? Como very rude woman. <laughs> I am not very rude, but I feel in love with yes. rude people. <laughs> Especially women. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, and I, I start to uh, um, uh, read and I like it and I start to work uh, on it because um, also Copla is very bad thing in Spain. And I wanted to do a biography plus interviews with academics talking about this kind of music, doing uh, a, another version of the Copla, another visions of the Copla um, with, uh, with the LGTB community or the feminism, uh, etc., etc. And I stop, sorry, because mm. I talk too much. No. <laughs> uh, you all did exactly what I needed you to, which was like you explained your books <laughs> so I don't have to. and. Better in your <laughs> words than me. Um, yeah, these are all amazing books, but so um, you'll enjoy them. Um, so that's kind of like the genesis. That's like the starting point of the idea. You identify your subject and you go, okay, there's, there's something here. There's something I want to talk about. There's something I want to I tap into. Um, so then you, you've got to go forward from there and I imagine, and I actually jump ahead slightly, because I was thinking about this. How did you start doing your research, right? Because these are these are tricky these are tricky subjects. Like Amy, right? Not American, right? Um, <laughs> so to cover this, the Dust Bowl, which is a very distinctly American thing, I know you traveled here and you worked with the Library of Congress. You worked with institutions in, in Oklahoma, I believe, yeah. right? And then Barbara, you're researching somebody who lived thousands of years ago and like there is not much documentation on them. And um, and I know, and I know for you, Carla, like like you said, one of the central points was you were talking with other researchers on Dona Concha. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm curious about is like, what was kind of the your approach to your research, and kind of more importantly, was there anything where it's like, oh, okay, this this opens up the project for me, this takes it in a direction I hadn't planned, or were you like Oh, I have I have to make a choice here based on how little information I have. How did that process go? Yes, well, f for me, um, there's very little known about Hipparchia. About she lived in the fourth century BC. It was a time that, uh, where uh, women were uh, legally uh, inferior to men. By the way. <laughs> 
uh, and treated as, uh, as minors. Um, but there's about two paragraphs about, uh, about her known, and so uh, very little. Uh, but there's a little bit more known about other philosophers from her uh, philosophical movement. So I, I read about them. Um, I went to Greece to see where, where she had lived. Uh, she came from Maronea. It uh, was a big city in her time in the north of Greece. And when I went there, uh, it was a very little town, with one uh, square with a big tree and a few houses around it, a little harbor, and that's about it. But it was a place where I did, there were still ruins from uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, so I, uh, I did feel a little bit connected with the place that she was here. Uh, so that was that was kind of special. Um, and uh, you had a second question. Well, about yeah. Was there was there anything that opened up for you? I mean, I was thinking one of the things in your afterward was even if you didn't have a lot on Hipparcia, you were able to research so much yeah. about what that time was like and include that in the drawing. Yes, and what what a special moment was for me uh, personally was that I found out I had already chosen uh, her as a subject, and and while I was working on the book, I found out and I was re researching, I found out that uh, uh, the philosophical movement of hers was the starting point for the Stoics. I don't know. Does anybody know the Stoic yeah. philosophy? It's mm. quite no. Yeah. So it's getting more and more known, and I'm a big fan, <laughs> and it helped me through a, a difficult period. So I, I'm personally attached to that, uh, that uh, philosophical movement, the Stoics. And uh, Hipparchia, she was the starting point for uh, the Stoics. So that was like, oh, now I understand why I felt so uh, connected with her. So that was uh, a, a, a very s a special moment for me to find out during the process. I think that's uh, <laughs> is that a yeah, good, no. good answer. <laughs> we want to learn about your process, you know. Um, yeah, I, I I feel a lot of connection with what Barbara is saying because she she went to Greece to do research, and I think for historical graphic novels, that's that's the first thing you need to do is to go to that place. I mean, obviously, you can't travel back in time. Um, <laughs> There are no time machines, unfortunately, but you can go to that place. And that's, for me, that was very important to see uh, the region of the Dust Bowl, which is in the, the center of the United States, so parts of Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas. Um, so I flew out there um, and I rented a car and just drove around and I did a lot of research there, took a lot of photos, I spoke to many people um, from museums and from historical societies just to interview them about the Dust Bowl and what it was like. Um, but I think that the most important thing for me was just to be there and to, to smell it and to touch it. And um, f to give you one example, I live in the Netherlands and our soil is just so much different than the soil in Oklahoma. It's in Holland, the, the color and the texture is it's very different. It's kind of dark brown, grayish um, uh, stuff. And then when I went to Oklahoma, suddenly it was bright orange and like the stones were much bigger and stuff. And I was just literally just touching the soil the whole time and, and trying to, to remember, you know, because when I went back home, I had to draw that, <laughs> that stuff. <laughs> and I would never have known if I had just used Google Street View, you know. You'd <laughs> So I, I was really happy to go to that place. Um, and I think, well, there's many examples like that. Like when I was there, I, I came across so many things I could never have thought of. Things you can't Google, you know. Uh, in the end, you can only Google what you think you know um, because you need a search term. <laughs> but if you're there, suddenly you come across some kind of animal that you've never seen before, or you see a kind of plant that you thought, oh, I, I didn't know this was growing here. Oh, cool, I'll draw it. <laughs> so, so for research, uh, for me, for this book, definitely going to that place was, was the most important thing in the research. 
Bueno, well, for me, um, I did the research, uh, basically reading Google, <laughs> and uh, interview these researchers, and I use I go to the uh, house house museum of of her, uh, but the 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 time and and I see all all her films uh, also because I wanted to be to see how she moves and how she speaks and how, but uh, she was very tricky because in in films she was very uh, she was always very professional she was not very. Um, she was very rude, so she was very professional. But no, no, she she does. She, you can see her uh, personally never because she was very professional always. No, uh, I I decided uh, when you work in a auto in a biography, you always have to choose. No, you have to choose what parts of the life of this person uh, are important and. And the importance is for you, for the creator. Uh, so it's uh, it's a fiction; it's not real. Um, but I decide as I I think the 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 most important thing that uh, it was a magical moment for me. It was when I, I was doing the research and I was um, uh, asking. Uh, for buying books uh, of her in, in in internet and receive it in my home, and then I buy a very very uh, cheap book. I think it was five euros uh, of of Concha, of the lyrics lyrics <laughs> of, of the sing of the songs of Concha, and I receive it and I said, oh, okay, it's. I it's it's I I spent uh, no como se dice I waste waste I wasted <laughs> my money uh, it's not very interesting but, and then I picked the, the the book and I start to open and I I see something right and I see blah 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 sign Concha Piquet y yo, oh. <laughs> y yo, and I I feel like an epiphany yeah and it was, you have to do something with this woman. And I said, okay, I will start to work on, on this woman. And it, that was the best moment of my research. I mean, I mean that kind of goes into, I had sent them the questions before and the, and the one I flipped around, but it, it, it is this thing. Like, one of the, one of the big moments in, in Amy's book is the photographer, like, is, is sent there to take picture of the, Take pictures of the poor people in Dust Bowl. We're Americans. We, we know that story. But kind of with the idea of like, you don't necessarily have to document the reality. You can, um, you can, you can juice it up a little bit so that people back home can get a can get more energy out of it. And uh, I laugh about this because I did a very similar panel to this three years ago, the last time we were here in person. And I learned a very valuable lesson in that one of the biographers was like, oh, no, I just made up most everything in the book. Like, and I was like, but I, it felt so real. I thought, it was, I thought this all happened. Did you, did you start from a point of, OK, I am going to tell the truth? Or did you rapidly go, that's going to be impossible. I have to let that go. Or did you even start from the truth is is kind of up in the air here. I have I have another goal with this biography. Um, yeah. So so I guess what you're referring to is that in um, in Days of Sand, and this actually happened that the FSA photographers um, were sent out to places to document poor farmers with their camera, um, but they were actually given a script, and these were called shooting scripts, and you can still find them at the Library of Congress. And it was basically a list of subjects that they had to shoot. So they would just, like a grocery list, you know, follow those things. Um, but the lists were drafted by people in the office in Washington. So they'd never actually been to Alabama or Oklahoma. Or So very often the photographers would, would come to a place and then see the list and think, oh, this is weird because this is not here, um, and just 
create their own list and do their own thing. But there were other photographers who took the list very seriously and just followed everything. And sometimes that meant uh, staging photographs. So for example, they would uh, get a prop, like, like a skull, like a steer skull. This is one of the most famous examples. And put it like, in a certain landscape and then take a picture. And once this was discovered, it was kind of a big uh, controversy about the whole photography program because people were like, okay, but what can we believe now if, if photos are staged, you know, um, then all <coughs> photos could be faked. Um, so th that's part of the book. Um, and for me, it's, it's kind of, it's the same thing, you know, the, um, with photography, but also with comic books, um, you are playing with reality. You are playing, like a sculptor is playing with clay as an artist and as a photographer, you're playing with reality and you can use as much of it as you want. Um, for me, I, I deliberately um, chose for historical fiction. <laughs> so it is based in history, the Dust Bowl really happened, the photographers were really there and all the details and the shoes and the cars and all of that is all accurate and rooted in the history. But the main character is totally fiction. <laughs> he didn't exist. He's based on a lot of people in that time, but he didn't exist. And that gave me some kind of liberty to, to tell the story that I wanted to tell and to emphasize the things I wanted to emphasize. And I think if it would have been 100% like biography of, let's say, Walker Evans or Dorothea Lang, um, I wouldn't have had so much freedom. Uh, you know, you have to. You have to check with the family, you have to check with the facts. And I mean, I would feel that way. I would feel like I owe it to them to make a realistic thing. And I was actually happy to have a fictional character so I could just do whatever I wanted. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question. No, yeah, but but it, it's, it's not the same as the other two books, I guess, because it's, it is fiction, um, while the other two are biographies. So I'm, I'm curious of the other, <laughs> the other answers. <laughs> well, um, uh, Mm, what uh, I think, uh, Barbara, your Hipatia says, what is the truth of one person? You mm -hmm. <laughs> never know the truth. You always have to do a, a interpretation of the of this person, uh, and um, you try to be. Res I, in my case, I try to be respectful, but you have to fictionate a lot because uh, a life is interesting, but it's not dramatic. <laughs> so if you are writing, you need to be dramatic or put something, uh, some things uh, to decorate uh, this life and become more uh, um, uh, interesting for, for the reader. No? But it's a very thin line. Uh, you, you can um, fiction a, a lot, like for example, I... Uh, the favorite, have you seen the film? No, the favorite is very respectful, but then suddenly happen stranger things <laughs> and you see the film and say, what the fuck? <laughs> <No>? <laughs> but, or you can be very respectful with the story, with the, but all, I think you always have to be uh, creating, creating things or uh, becoming, to become the, the story more in interesting. And I, th I, I finish with this, and I think that is, you have to be, in my case, I try to be very respectful because you, have, you are putting your words in, 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 the, in another person that exists, and maybe this person have family or uh, herederos. Heirs. <laughs> So, uh, in my case, uh, the heirs were, were alive, and uh, well, uh, I tried to be very respectful because I wanted to give importance to her professionally, not personally, uh, and that's I th uh, that's what I think. Did you have contact with the heirs? Yes. After, afterwards, also, yes. did they read the book? Yes. And what did they think? <laughs> uh, they uh, they like it. They like it, and it was very very strange. All I <laughs> it it was uh, very bizarre also. <laughs> uh, 
I, I contact, well, it was very sad because the, the, um, the daughter dead when the books become out, <laughs> <laughs> when the books print, the daughter dead. And then I meet the, the, um, the nieta, how is she, nieta? The granddaughter, eso. Uh, the granddaughter, and uh, I, I give one, and she, I love it, I love <laughs> it. It's exactly like my grandmother. Yeah, and I say, oh my God, <laughs> can't believe it. And she like it, and she uh, meet with me in a bar and pick six or seven books, and please sign me this to my <laughs> friend. And this another for my another friend. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but she was very nice and a very good person. Oh. And she gave me a lot of money. So <laughs> <laughs> I am very happy. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, for me, of course, it was impossible to tell the truth about Hipparchia because there's so little known about her. Um, but what I wanted is to capture the philosophy of her so that was that was my aim and i did a book before this uh vincent about vincent van gogh the the writer vincent van gogh you say <laughs> <laughs> the the painter and there's a lot known about him and i um and there, and he wrote a lot of letters so i made this uh, graphic novel based upon the letters uh, so based upon uh his own words and after Vincent, I purposely uh, um, uh, wanted um, a subject that was not uh, well known, so I could use my fantasy more. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the reasons that I chose uh, Hipparchia, a not known uh, uh, philosopher. Uh, and I had to, the, 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 her, her character is, of course, 100% uh, well, 99%. <laughs> 95% <laughs> <fi> fiction. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, there were things like she was born in Maronea, that is known, and she got, uh, fell in love with the ideas and way of life of Krates, that's a, a philosopher uh, wha who was living on the streets like a vagrant, and she in the end, now I'm spoiling the story, in the end she's marrying uh, a Kratos and goes to live together with him on the streets. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in menopause and some, uh, sometimes <laughs> you have a blank. <laughs> uh, no, I forgot, so no. that's it. But, that, <laughs> but, you know, again, like, that's, that's one of those things that we take for granted, right? The, the reader goes in like, ah, it's time for me to learn the true story. And the more I've worked with people's biography, the more I'm like, oh yeah, like how much could they actually know? Like how, there's a lot of, there's a lot of invention. And one of, the, um, one of the other things that I found interesting about these three books is all three of them kind of break the frame a bit, right? We've talked about like, oh, if we actually dig into it, there's, you know, there, this isn't like you get a beam of information from the sky of like, now I know the life of this person. There's research, there's parts where you, the artist, step in and go like, okay, I have to askew the truth a little bit, or I have to present some version of things because we don't, we don't have a record of it. But in all cases, each of these books was like, no, I need to bring you into the present. I need to take you out of the moment a little bit. In the middle of Amy's books, like in between book, in between the pages, here's just the real photo, right? Here's just the real photo. When I picked, you know, the iconic one, the one we all learned in school, right? In the middle of Carla's book, like you've been with Donna Concha for like 100 pages, and then boom, we're with Carla in the present day, talking to researchers. So like, oh, I've, I've taken you out of this kind of hermetically sealed narrative. Now, there's, there's a little bit less of that in Barbara's book, but it's the big moment. That's the first page, right? There, we, you, it's bookended in the present. 
you being like, this is where she was, and then the last pages, I won't spoil those, <laughs> you're back in the present, right? Where did the decision come, where, on, where along the lines did you make the decision like, okay, I'm going to break the form up a little bit, and, and why did you decide to do that? Uh, well, in my case, it's because uh, uh, the concept of doing a biographical book, it wasn't very interesting for me <laughs> <laughs> uh, in concept, because uh, you have to do only, uh, well, not only, I mean, you understand me. Um, you have to uh, research and do this thing, but I, I wanted to um, uh, experiment in different levels of uh, languages, not only vi visual languages, and um, with with including in these interviews of the researchers. To when when I have a, a scene about a, a theme, a theme, tema, ¿cómo se dice? Mm -hmm. Sí, tema. Está bien dicho. Vale, theme. Uh, that it was very related with the researcher's investigation, I put the interview and you, I cut the, the, um, the narrative. But it was also a, a experimentation with the narrative also. Uh, doing all, only the, in, uh, the beginning, the middle and the end of our life, it wasn't very interesting. And also I have another third level of experimentation that it's these uh, squares in the middle that most readers think that it's um, uh, maybe uh, covers between uh, is, is scenes, but it's not. It's a, another experimental shared story about uh, Doña Concha that I put in and that the reader can play with the, 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 all the story. So you can read the biographical in black and white, the interviews in Beton and with uh, a little bit meta because I, I, I am in the comic and there are people and uh, there are in important information and it's a third level that it's very experimental because it's only a, a very short and uh, a very small panel about a uh, the, well, this is a little spoiler, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a, a, and she was uh, during she was in in United States. Doña Concha start singing in United States uh, in the twenties, and she was. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice? La intentaron violar. They tried to rape her, and these uh, small panels uh, tells that story, but it's very lyrical it's very experimental and at the and when you read the the comic you don't know what is this going or and what it's happening so it's thinking to be re, being read a lot of times and you can discover things when you read and read and read and read the comic and and that's what is interesting for me of of this comic that it was very conceptual Um, yeah, so, wow, I love this. I'm, I'm so curious to read <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so for me, the, the photography was the starting point of the book. And so I, I knew from the beginning I wanted to include photos, and I already found out that they are in the public domain, so that means you can just use them for free. Um, so I decided, okay, I want to use some photos also to show the reader that there were actually photographers making these beautiful pictures because they're they're gorgeous. I mean, this is a good example, but all of them are yep. it's just stunning. Um, so at first we we so me and the publisher decided to put it all the way at the end of the book, like a doshe. So if, after you finish the story, you could read a little bit of the background and history and see all those beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of tucked away at the end. And I, I was still searching for some way to fill in the chapter pages, because there's about seven chapters. And it was just a blank page with a number, which was kind of boring. And I don't, obviously, I don't, well, I, I don't like that. <laughs> I want it to be like a visual book. So blank pages for me are no-go. Um, and I don't really remember when it happened, but at some point I just thought, 
well, what happens if I just put the photos on those chapter pages? What happens? And it turned out that if the photos were very relevant to uh, the stories, so for example, the drawings that came before and after, that they would integrate beautifully and it would be like one movement of, um, of reading, like they wouldn't really take you out of the story at all. And, and maybe one example I can give you, but it's probably hard to see, but this is a photograph of a bread line in New York uh, during the Great Depression, so there's people in line waiting for bread and soup and the line of people goes around the corner of the bridge. And at the moment you flip the page, so you're basically physically going around the corner, the line ends in the drawing. And so that way you can, you can really connect the photos and the images together. And it's not interrupting anything, it's just very fluently. And this happens in every chapter. So it, it took a while to figure that out, but <laughs> in the end it worked out okay. <laughs> Uh, well, to me, it was um, important to make a link with the present uh, with this story. So I did not want it to be a history book. I want it to be a book uh, that we can uh, get inspiration from uh, f uh, for yeah our times now. So I was thinking um, how to make this link to the present. And uh, in the beginning, I had the idea that um, um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, go back and forth with the story of Hipparchia and with m uh, an autobiographical storyline about how I'm uh, making uh, this, uh, this book. But I found out that it didn't, didn't work at all, flipping back and forth from uh, the past to the present in, in this story. But um, I, it took me five years to make this book, and during these five years, I was struggling with this. Yes. <laughs> Madre mia. And, um, uh, and then r at the ending, I had almost finished uh, the story, and uh, I was at the last page, I made the last page, but I was not happy with the ending. And I was thinking about it, and then uh, one day I was not uh, working on the book. I was just uh, riding on the bicycle, uh, yeah, relaxing, and then whoosh, ah, I had this idea. <laughs> I have to uh, uh, begin and end the book with uh, the autobiographical page about me uh, f yeah, being in uh, Maronea and at the ending being uh, at the same place. I'm going to do what you did. I'm going <laughs> to show something. Cause, yeah. uh, here, this was this was the ending. You cannot see it, but this is Hipparchia and Kratis, and Hipparchia decided to go live on the streets, and she's here in nature that uh, to give um, the uh, to to show the freedom. They were living in Athens and and uh, um, uh, among uh, amongst uh, the people and and teaching and everything. But I wanted to um, show. Yeah, the, the freedom that they had uh, uh, because they renounced all their uh, material possessions. And then when you flip the page, here's the sun and the, and the sea and a, a little island. And then you flip the page, <laughs> one page. Oh. Then you, s it's the present, but there's the sea and the little island and the sun. So it's in the same place in Athens. And me and uh, my husband, my husband, <laughs> uh, we are standing here and we can see how our, our society became and uh, that we did not listen to Hipparchia and Kratis and we should have. That's what I want to say. As, as we're kind of, as we're kind of uh, wrapping up, that's kind of what I wanted to get to at, at the end of the line of questioning was you know, you, you've, you've invested this time, this energy. We, we all, all, every cartoonist is laughing at the five years to do a book, because we're like, yep, 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 that makes sense, right? And, and you, Barbara, you've, you've kind of answered the question of like, what do I want all of the audience to take away from this? Like, you know, what did Hipparchia have to say? What, and what does that bode for us now? But, it, but for all of you, as kind of our final question, was you know when when you've done all this work when you've put all this energy in did you have did you settle on something that you're like yeah this is why I need to put this work out 
right? This is, you know, this is the message, right? Maybe it wasn't the message you even began with, but at the end you're like, this is what this book brings to the table. This is what this book brings to the audience. Can I just go on? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it, it took me five years, and in the, these five years, a lot of things happened. Uh, Trump became president, and <laughs> we get, got COVID, and Me Too, and uh, Black Lives Matters, and all these things. And, and while I was making it, uh, a couple of times I thought, oh, maybe now uh, this, the, the, the message is uh, outdated. But every time um, um, I noticed that it was the opposite, that I thought, yeah, but this is what Hipparchia said. And, and you know, <laughs> so um, to me, what is the most uh, important message um, from Hipparchia is um, that we should look at our um, general values and norms and uh, should we oppose them or which ones should we oppose of, and I think there are many, like the ideas that we have about uh, the roles of men and women and uh, the ideas we have about possession and wealth and social rank, these are all, uh, we have these set ideas in our society and I think they need a lot of shaking up that's the message that I hope, yeah, that it will be an inspiration for readers. I, th I think there's, and I should say, as a very belated introduction as we're wrapping up, uh, that the three graphic biographies that I worked on in the past several years are on Gertrude Stein, uh, Virginia Woolf, and George O'Keefe. Uh, but I found, and I wonder if any of you did, that there's a real tension between biography as a way of bringing a historical figure back to life, seeing them as a real three-dimensional person, but also the fact that by narrating their life from beginning to end, you sort of present a lot of their choices as predetermined. And that's of course not the case, right? So I think you know, any biography has to grapple at some level with that tension between knowing how the person's story ends and the way that that ending reflects on the beginning and the middle but also, again, hopefully bring them to life to some extent and, and give the readers a sense of them as a real person. Um, <laughs> well, it, for me, there, there were so many things that I, during the process, I thought, well, this is, this is the message. And then a couple of weeks later, oh, th this is the message. <laughs> it just kept changing, but I guess the overall message would be that um, history repeats and um, we never learn <laughs> because you know the Dust Bowl <laughs> happened in the 30s and it was it was a consequence of over cultivation on of the land so farmers came and worked on the land and plowed up the soil and at the moment that there was uh, a couple years of drought and heat waves all the soil went into the air with the slightest gust of wind and we had these huge dust storms. That's the Dust Bowl. Well, I mean, I don't have to tell you all that what, what kind of summer we had this year. I mean, it was dry, um, it was very warm, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. And in fact, I spoke to ecologists for this book and they all told me within 20 years, we're gonna see another Dust Bowl. So that means that we're all gonna see you know, we're gonna live to see that, and that's kind of scary. So, um, I've, I've, you know, I've been working with the Dust Bowl for some time now as a historical phenomenon, but now I'm starting to think that maybe it's even a futuristic book. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of science fiction without the fiction. It's like, this is our future, which is scary, but maybe that's the message. It's, it's kind of sad, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, for me, um, I think in Spain we have a lot of problems, but, but uh, one of the most important problems that we have, <coughs> sorry, it's that we are very always uh, embarrassing about our, our own culture. We are not very proud of our own culture. And when I did this book, um, the, the purpose was to uh, put on value the, the copla and the, the uh, and Concha Piquer as a very important patrimony of Spain 
uh, that never, never uh, have been, um, uh, bueno, es el value. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's the, the main purpose of the of the of the book, and also we always knew uh, very important persons of United States, of, of for example, uh, Maria Callas or uh, Edith Piaf, but no one knows. Uh, bueno, Rosalía, ¿no? <laughs> you know Rosalía, ¿no? <laughs> Rosalía. But uh, I think more historical, ¿no? And I think it's important to uh, recuperar, uh, recover these characters and put on value. And that's what I did this comic. I think we may be at time. Uh, we are at time, but we do have time for about maybe three or four minutes, maybe three minutes of questions. Yeah, if anybody so has you can go to the mic with your question, please. Oh, dear. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, Hi. Thank you for this amazing panel. Um, so just to introduce my little provenance here, so I'm an anthropologist and my friend here is a photojournalist. So we do talk a lot about making stories and engaging with the real um, and how we do that. Um, so I have a question specifically for Carla. Ah. So <laughs> my research is on sex workers and Tierney and I have met through our uh, both collective research on sex workers wait, in Washington, D.C. You are talking very, very fast sorry, and I am sorry. not I don't understand. <laughs> In my, in my head is blah, 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 blah. <laughs> my bad. Okay. okay. So the both of us okay. do our research ah, okay. on sex workers. Ah, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sex workers um, in D.C., Washington, D.C. Ah. So I am the coordinator of the, the uh, sex worker decrim campaign. Wow. So that came through my research as an anthropologist on sex workers. So that's background for the question I'm going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> so my question is, um, you called yourself a normal woman earlier. <laughs> no, I am not that very normal. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm curious about like your writing process for this piece, um, engaging with the people who were uh, Dania Concha's contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So these um, marginalized yet still very much um, agentive uh, women. Was that part of the writing process? Because we see a lot of you speaking with researchers, but how else are you understanding the, the you know, the provenance of this person's life and her, her music and her art? Thank you. Vale. Um, well, uh, it was all the, the process, no? I, just, as I just started the research and I talked with the researchers that I respect too much because I am very silly and normal. No, <laughs> I'm not ni silly ni, ni normal. <laughs> um, and I start to uh, learn the in of, of you. But I think the academy have a problem that your your works doesn't go to the people. And comic, it's a very 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 good man manera manner. To, well, you understand, okay? <laughs> it's a very good manner to, it's a uh, popular art. So your information I bring, the, your information, <laughs> I rob your information, <laughs> and go to the people. <laughs> and it was very interesting because I think also the academy have another problem that you speak very, uh, very intellectual and with a lot of very, uh, words with a lot of sound or blah, 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 blah. And uh, the, the people want the information more simple. And comic, it's a very good form to, uh, to, to go to, to, bueno, tú me entiendes. <laughs> so, um, uh, if for me, it was a, all a, a learning process. And I, I learned a lot of feminism, a lot of, uh, how was important for the LGTB community this music because they can um, 
sing their loves uh, without problem because uh, the lyrics of the of this music um, talks about impossible uh, loves. So when a gay sing this song can um, feel uh, feel represented, no? So the gay community uses a lot of this kind of music. And uh, and also the women that being heated by his uh, um, his hus husband or uh, very marginal woman can um, uh, shout the problems without any problem, and I think it's it's very uh, interesting and the, it's very uh, mad that the principal composer of these lyrics was gay and Franco, the dictatorship of the far right, love this music, so it's, a, it's, it's <laughs> very crazy. <laughs> I imagine Franco sings uh, the songs of a um, gay, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And I love this, so excuse me, um, I, I talk too much. <laughs> no. So I, I learn a lot of, the, I think researchers do a very good work, but sometimes you lose in the academy. That's my um, my conclusion. Okay. <laughs> We're at time, and we should be respectful for the next group. But this was great. You, this, I'm so glad to hear all this from you. you. This is amazing, and these are amazing books. So you all should get them um, <laughs> and, and talk to these amazing artists. Thank you all. Yeah.